Pastor Jeff, why don't you make your way up here as he's coming up. Uh, we do have an outline of his message on pa page 17 of, of the handbook, uh, if you're interested. Well, turn in your Bibles with me, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And as our brother said, I provided an outline, one of those fill-in-the-blank outlines that I offer to my folks there in Grand Rapids each week so they can keep up with me, and it's a good discipline for me to stay on track. So you should get out of here by about 9 o'clock tonight if you want to do that. Verses 8 to 13 is our text for this evening. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead, descendant of David according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not imprisoned. For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. It is a trustworthy statement, for if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Now, I believe in the promise of the Lord Jesus who said that the Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. A man can prepare a message, and a nice little alliterated outline that you have there, but no man can manufacture the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You can't give it to me, I can't give it to myself, nor can I give you ears to hear. And so I want you to pray with me tonight before we look at the word for God to do what only he can do. Let's pray. Father, we sense our weakness. We sense our dependence upon you. In fact, we're so dependent upon you that we can't even know our dependence upon you and how much we need you unless you give us that sense. And we thank you for the promises of your word. And though we are slow in heart to believe, we pray that our slowness of heart to believe would not cause you to despise us, but to pity us in our folly. And we pray, Father, tonight that you would give us the Holy Spirit in great measure. Not that we do not possess him already, but more, a greater measure of his spirit upon the preacher and upon listener alike. We pray, Lord, you would brand your truth upon our hearts. God, even though there may be truths that we're very familiar with, may we hear them with such freshness. It's as though it's the first time we've ever heard them. Set our souls on a blaze for the Lord Jesus Christ first of all, and then for souls who need him. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Now, just warning, if you see me, bend down. I'm not having a heart attack. My water's down there, so I think that's why this water's in this pulpit, and so don't be worried if you see me do that. I can, I can feel it maybe coming on here in a few minutes. 2 Timothy 2, 8 to 13 is our text tonight, and, the, and the, I've entitled it simply, Gospel-Driven Faithfulness Through a Sacrificial Ministry. Now, I guess it could be argued tonight, and if you were to give this argument, I wouldn't offer a counter-argument that a brother serving the Lord on a foreign field somewhere would probably be a better option for addressing this theme. Again, I wouldn't offer a counter-argument to that, but I would imagine that if such a brother were chosen, he would feel the same way. Certainly some other brother serving in a much more difficult set of circumstances would be a better option, and he would be better qualified and has more, he has more experience. In fact, I think all of us would feel a little awkward with this task. Because which one of us would want to present himself as though he's somehow the great example of this thing? Uh, that he's the great example to follow, that he has all the experience and knowledge. What has helped me with it is this. 
whether you're a foreign missionary or doing mission work domestically or you're just a homegrown local pastor just trying to keep the church together and keep that couple from blowing apart, the gospel ministry is the gospel ministry. And the gospel ministry is difficult. The gospel ministry is hard work. I mean, don't get me wrong. There, there are many joys. I, I love what I do. I don't want to stop doing what I'm doing. But it is hard work no matter what division of labor that you're in. We're all a part of the mission. We just have different assignments. And all of those assignments are difficult work. And before we get in our text this evening, which is verses 8 to 13, I want you to consider with me just for a few minutes how the Apostle Paul presses this point on Timothy. After encouraging him in verse 1 to endure hardness for the sake of Christ and to train faithful men for the ministry in verse 2, in verses 3 to 6, Paul employs three images to illustrate what faithfulness to the gospel ministry requires. The first image illustrates how the gospel ministry demands austerity. Austerity is strictness of condition or life. Notice what he says in verse 3. He says, Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Timothy, being a minister is like being a soldier. You're not going to have a normal life. If you signed up for the ministry thinking you are going to live a civilian life, you need your head examined. A soldier has to live an austere life, a strict life, singularly focused to carry out the orders of the one who enlisted him. He cannot be distracted by many of the mundane concerns of everyday life. He has to be prepared at all times for battle. The second image illustrates how the gospel ministry demands discipline and self-denial. Notice what he says in verse 5. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. Timothy, there's no cheating in the ministry. Now, what's one of the reasons that an athlete would be tempted to cheat and to break the rules in order to win the contest? He doesn't want to put in the time and energy required to win fairly and squarely. To compete and to win the prize according to the rules demands self-discipline to train and to prepare rigorously. Timothy, if you're going to do the ministry according to the rules of King Jesus, it's going to take truckloads of self-discipline and self-denial. The third image illustrates how the gospel ministry demands exhausting and patient labor. Verse 6. The hard-working farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Farming, now I know little to nothing about farming. Where's Gordon? I think Gordon could probably tell us a little bit. My fellow elder could probably tell us a little bit. But something tells me that farming was even a lot harder back in this day than it is even today. Farming is exhausting work. You have to get up early. You have to fight the elements, you have to deal with all types of conditions, swatting away the bugs, sweat dripping from your brow, running off the end of your nose. You can't delay, you can't procrastinate. And it requires patience. The payoff for all of that hard work doesn't come until later. If you're a farmer, you've got to put in a lot of work and live with delayed gratification. Timothy ministry requires this kind of exhausting toil and labor and most of the time you're not going to enjoy the fruit until much later. Now each of these illustrations Paul uses to picture the gospel ministry, they all three have at least this in common. None of them is an easy way of life. Each requires hard work, focus, unwavering commitment to accomplish the task. And Paul says to Timothy in verse 7, Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Timothy, I want you to think deeply and prayerfully about each of these illustrations, each of these images, and how each one illustrates faithfulness to the gospel ministry. Now you 
ask the $64 question, what does this have to do with our theme for the week? Sacrifice for missions. Well, may I suggest that to be a faithful soldier, to be a successful athlete, to be a fruitful farmer, each one of those requires a measure of sacrifice. Would you agree with that? At least this. Each one requires the sacrifice of a life of comfort and ease. If you want comfort and ease, that's your top priority. Don't be an athlete that wins according to the rules. Don't be a farmer and please don't be a soldier. Each requires to give up a life of comfort and ease. And there's no doubt that this is what Paul has in mind because in verse 9 of our text, Paul tells Timothy that he had sacrificed comfort and ease. He had given up his own freedom for the sake of being faithful to his calling to preach the gospel to sinners. He was locked away in a prison and labeled as an evildoer. And he's encouraging Timothy to be willing to do the same thing. For if you remember back in chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, we learned that Timothy was showing signs of slacking off. He was beginning to back away from the demands of the ministry. And so Paul writes there, For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or me, his prisoner, but join me, join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Now, probably, I would guess that Timothy's weak physical constitution that we learned, back, learned about in the other letter probably didn't help his timidity. The fact that perhaps he already knows or maybe he already at least has some hints that the Apostle Paul is going to be leaving him, his father in the faith. He didn't have a believing father. Perhaps all those things combined were discouraging Timothy, and he was backing away from faithfulness to the ministry. And Paul is encouraging him, be faithful to the gospel no matter what needs to be sacrificed, no matter what you must suffer to do it. Be faithful to your calling to preach the gospel to sinners and to saints, regardless, Timothy, of what it costs you in this life. In this passage, Paul is encouraging Timothy to stay the course, to up his game by supplying him with four gospel-centered motives. Now, man, I've come this week to be an encouragement to you. I've not come to put you on a guilt trip and say, you need to be doing more. I have learned as a pastor, guilt trips are short trips. They don't last. Really get into people's consciences about prayer meeting, and it'll fill up for two weeks. And then once the arrows go out, you, it'll dwindle down, right? Well, we've tried that kind of stuff. Paul sends Timothy on a grace trip in the gospel car. And that's what I want us to do tonight because I know how it is for some of you. As you come, some of you are coming from very discouraging situations with your family, with your church. And so I want this to be an encouragement to you. And if you're slacking off, and Lord knows if that's true, these motives should do it. And so I want us to look at these four gospel-centered motives that Paul gives to Timothy to encourage him to stay faithful to the gospel no matter what he has to sacrifice. So as we come to the passage... I would have you to note with me, first of all, that in verse 8, Paul encourages Timothy by pointing him to the person of the gospel. The person of the gospel. He says in verse 8, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel. Now, I don't think Paul is fearful that Timothy has literally forgotten about Jesus Christ. He's exhorting him to focus in a fresh way, to focus his attention in a fresh way upon his Savior, Jesus Christ. And he instructs Timothy to focus on two related facts about him. Timothy, remember that Jesus is the risen Christ. He's the risen Christ. Now, you can't see this in your English translation, 
But the tense of the verb risen means that Jesus Christ, who was raised from the dead, remains risen in the present. In other words, he is saying, Timothy, focus on Jesus, the one who right now is alive from the dead. And also remember, Timothy, focus on the fact that this risen Christ is the reigning Christ. That little phrase, descendant of David, what does that mean? Well, that means that Jesus, the risen Christ, who has ascended into heaven, has been seated upon a throne in fulfillment of God's promise to his servant David, that of his seed he would raise up the Christ who would sit upon his throne forever, of whose kingdom there will never be an end. That's all packed into that little phrase, descendant of David. So he's saying, Timothy, Focus on Jesus Christ, the one who got up from the dead, who remains alive, and who is seated at God's right hand, reigning and ruling as king. Now, interestingly, the apostle does not explain to Timothy how focusing his attention on Jesus as the risen and reigning Christ is supposed to motivate him. And commentators, if you were to search commentaries on this, they offer various explanations and go down different trails. Scripturally, of course, there are lots of, there are many options. There are several ways that this glorious truth can encourage gospel ministers to press on regardless of the cost. You know that. But personally, I'm not convinced that Paul has left this open so that we could apply whatever aspect of the risen and reigning Christ we might need at any moment for encouragement. Now, you can do that. I don't think God will get mad at you for doing that. But personally, I think that Paul doesn't spell out the reason as to why this should motivate Timothy in order to leave the focus entirely upon Jesus. And therefore, I take Paul to be saying to Timothy, focus on Jesus, the risen and reigning king, and be reminded, Timothy, that he is worthy of all that you must endure and sacrifice for the gospel ministry. Now, I believe that maybe even a clue to that is when he goes on to say, according to my gospel, my gospel is... Timothy is not first and foremost about the plan of salvation. My gospel first and foremost is about the man of salvation, Jesus Christ. All that I endure, Timothy, all that I sacrifice in the ministry is for the one of whom my gospel is about, Jesus Christ. And this this comports perfectly with what the Lord says to Ananias when he's trying to convince him you know, trying to butter him up, getting him ready for Saul's conversion and telling him that he'd been saved. You remember what the Lord says to Ananias? In Acts 9, 15 and 16, he says to Ananias, Go, for he, that Saul, the apostle Paul, is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my sake. My sake. All the suffering that Paul experienced that we read about in the New Testament, he primarily did for this reason. He did it for Jesus. Do you remember the apostles in the earliest days of the church? They they had the same perspective when they suffered at the hands of the religious leaders. Acts 5.41 we read, So they went on their way from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. You know what that tells us? That they, were, that they were joyful because they were counted worthy, not primarily because they were suffering for the cause, but because they were being identified with the Christ. They were doing it for Jesus. This first motivation that Paul gives to Timothy, I would say no doubt is the highest and greatest motivation to give our all for the gospel ministry, no matter the cost. I mean, look. If he's not enough, nothing else will ever do. It's the theme of our time together this week. I love how it's stated. Sacrifice for missions, what? He is worthy 
not primarily the souls are worthy, the cause is worthy. Folks, the risen reigning Jesus is worth everything we give him. Now I could say a lot about this taking up the rest of our time this evening, working this out and why he's worthy. But I'll limit myself to just one thing that I want to say. And guys, for some reason, this is still popping up here. Is it popping to you as I'm preaching? Okay. Sorry for interrupting. But this is going to drive me crazy. I'm suffering. I'm suffering. I'm suffering. All right. That's better. My fault. Just ask my wife. It's all my fault. Now, I can say a lot about this, take, as I said, take up the rest of our time unfolding why Jesus himself is worthy of our best. But I'll limit myself to one thing I want to say. Now, I would imagine that for many of us, even if we don't know the day or the hour when we were converted, we remember at least the general time frame which we were converted, or at least we remember about the time that we had a settled sense that we were saved and safe in Christ. And I, I can imagine that most of us could remember that. And do you remember, if you can recall that, you, do you remember how precious the gospel was? Do you remember that it struck you how real the gospel was? I mean, maybe you'd heard it a thousand times. And it was precious to you like never before. Why? Because he was precious and real to you. I remember that was one of the first things that struck me when I was truly saved was how real Jesus Christ Though I had never seen him, how real he was made to me by the person and work of the Holy Spirit. My eyes had been opened to perceive the glory of the risen and reigning Christ in the pages of Scripture. Many of you could look back on that time. Maybe it was before you had a thought about gospel ministry. Maybe you didn't know very much at all about theology. You thought eschatology was some form of cancer. I mean, that's, you knew very little about living the Christian life. But this what much was clear to you. Jesus Christ had captured your heart. He had ravished your heart, had captured your affections, and your life's goal simply was this. I want to live for him. If that means in Timbuktu as a missionary or down at the supermarket as a clerk for the rest of my life, I just want, having seen his glory and having seen his worth, I cannot imagine doing anything for the rest of my life except for loving and serving him. Did you know what's ironic? In the hustle and bustle of ministry, whether you're on a foreign field or at a local level, dealing with the daily demands and details of what must get done in the ministry, we can get our focus off Jesus Christ. And we've got to do those things. My son about a year ago asked me, he said, Daddy, do you like being a pastor? I said, yes. He says, do you like meetings? Because he's always asking me, where do you got to go somewhere tonight? Got a meeting. So he said, Daddy, do you like being a pastor? Yes. He said, do you like going to meetings? I said, no, I hate meetings. And he said, Daddy, that doesn't make sense because they're pretty much the same thing. <laughs> we, we have to do those things. But in the midst of all of those things, what's so ironic is we can get our focus off of Jesus Christ. That's why it's good sometimes to put your dead guys back on the shelf, clear your schedule, if possible, and just take some time to refocus on the Son of God. And if you've got some dead guys or living guys, they're all good. Select those that are particularly going to focus your heart and mind upon the person of Jesus Christ and his glory. The glory of his person. The perfection of his work. Take out the gospel records and trace his steps reflecting on how he became the risen and reigning Christ. That he came from heaven to earth to die for you. And just a reminder, he died for you not primarily to send you to the mission field but to save your wretched soul from hell. Focus on that until your heart cry is, for every drop of crimson blood thus shed to make me live, wherefore have not I a thousand lives to give? So brethren, this is not primarily about a cause. It's about a Christ. 
And then you know what might happen as you refocus your attention on him? You'll be filled with wonder and amazement. So, because not only did he have mercy upon my wretched, sin-sick soul, in his mercy, he chose me to be his ambassador. In his mercy, he took my sorry soul and put me into the ministry to let me spend the rest of my life telling people that he can do for them what he's done for me. This kind of focus on Jesus Christ is what drives faithfulness to a sacrificial ministry because he's worth everything I've got in this world. The person of the gospel. But it's not the only old motivation, is it? The second motivation Paul gives to Timothy is the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel. You know one of the best things, one of the best means to get you excited about the gospel is the gospel. Paul says in the beginning of verse 9, For which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not imprisoned. Paul is hindered from spreading the gospel. He's locked away. He's not far from death. He's hindered from traveling here and there to preach the gospel that, like he loved to do. Now that's a recipe for a depressed preacher. I'm going to be out of the pulpit for two weeks, and that's fine. I like the break, but do you get a little antsy after you're out of the pulpit for a little while? Imagine if you were locked away and you couldn't preach maybe for months. That's a recipe for depression. But Paul is showing no signs of discouragement. He's not imploding in upon himself for two reasons. First of all, because the word of God spreads irresistibly. The word of God spreads irresistibly. I love this verse. Paul says, I'm imprisoned, I'm chained up, but the word of God is not in prison. The word of God is not in prison. He's saying, I'm not on the move. I'm confined, but listen, you cannot confine the word of God. They've stopped me. And maybe they think in stopping me, they've stopped the word. But try as they will, evil men have never been, can never stop it. They've never been able to. Listen to what one man wrote. A famous picture in the convent library in Erfurt, Germany, depicts young, young Martin Luther poring over a copy of scripture in the morning light. The dawn steals through the open lattice, illuminating the Bible and his eager face. A broken chain hangs from the Bible. Now, what do you think the significance of that imagery is? I would take it to mean that at the Reformation, the word of God had broken loose from the chains of human tradition and from papal superstition, and it was once again on the move in Europe. You can put chains on the word of God, but it will always break it. It can't be stopped. And you know the reason it can't be stopped? Because Jesus is alive and he's reigning at the right hand of God. His word can no more be stopped than he can be stopped. You see, the Great Commission, guys, the Great Commission and gals, the Great Commission does not begin with go and make disciples, does it? Where does it begin? All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. And then he says, go. What's the picture of Jesus? Folks, when we, when we think of Jesus, we can't think of Jesus any longer in a state of humiliation. He's at the right hand of God in complete control. He's in charge of this operation. The Bible says in Psalm 110 that he's ruling in the midst of his enemies and his people will be willing in the day of his power. And because he's ruling in the midst of his enemies as the risen and reigning Christ, he can direct his gospel to go anywhere in this world that he wants it to go. There are no closed countries to Jesus Christ. There's no border that he can't cross. There's no sinner he can't find with his word. If he wants his word to get to a sinner on the furthest part of this globe, he's going to get it there because he's King Jesus. The word of God spreads irresistibly, and Paul adds to that that the word of God saves irresistibly. 
It saves irresistibly. Look at verse 10. For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who were chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus. Now Paul speaks of those who were chosen. God's elect. Those God has sovereignly chosen to save. What I like about the writers of the New Testament is that they were not embarrassed of this doctrine. It, it wasn't the family member they never, that they, they just didn't speak about. We're related to them, we just don't tell anyone. That's not how they did this doctrine. This was not locked up in a dusty confession. It's sprinkled all over the pages of the New Testament. They were not embarrassed of this word chosen or election, and we should not be either. For this doctrine, properly understood, fuels passion for missions. For the doctrine of election, let's, let's, just, let's just talk about it a few minutes. I know you know the doctrines of grace, but do me a favor. For about five minutes, act like you don't. Because I'm going to tell you very quickly. It's a doctrine. You know where that doctrine starts? It's a doctrine that starts with God himself. A God who is not up in heaven, biting his fingernails, wringing his hands in a cold sweat, hoping all of this is going to turn out well. It starts with a God who sits upon his throne, working all things after the counsel of his own will. Who does all of his good pleasure. Who in mercy and grace, though he could have condemned the whole bunch of us, in his mercy and grace chose to put his redeeming love on a multitude of sinners. And then flowing out of that doctrine is the execution of that eternal plan in history. In fulfillment of that eternal purpose, the Son of God came into the world via Mary's womb, living a sinless life for the elect. Living it for them, as them, as though they lived it. Dying as their substitute, bearing in his body their sins up to the tree, fully absorbing and extinguishing the wrath of God in their place. Not merely making salvation a possibility, but whose atoning death actually accomplished their salvation. Whose resurrection is God's receipt to every elect sinner who believes, a receipt that says, paid in full. Not one precious soul for whom Jesus died on Calvary will ever taste an ounce of the wrath of God. Not one flame of hell will ever touch them. He bore in his body our sins on the tree. He accomplished reconciliation. He accomplished redemption. It, his death secured the salvation of all for whom he died. And God knows where each one of his elect is in this world. And in his providence, he gets the gospel to them. He finds them. When he does, the Holy Spirit regenerates them. And they bow the knee to Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. Young man once said to Spurgeon, accused him and said, you preach that Christ saves sinners by dragging them to himself by the hair of their heads. And he said, well, if you could tell me the date of that sermon, I'd be much obliged. He says, I, I don't preach that Christ saves people by dragging them to himself by the hair of their heads. But he does draw them by their hearts quite as powerfully as your caricature suggests. He overcomes secretly in a way we don't understand. Their rebellion makes them want to come. And they do come most freely, being made willing by his grace. I think I've read that somewhere. And then God preserves each one of them so that as our text says, they obtain eternal glory in Christ. Brethren, on the last day, not one elect sinner will be missing. There they will be. All of them will stand 
in perfect conformity to Jesus Christ, body and soul, out of every tri tri tribe, kindred, tongue, and nation, singing praise to the Lamb. Now here's what's interesting. Far from killing or cooling off Paul's evangelistic zeal to get the gospel to, the, to sinners, the doctrine of election lit his fuse and set him on fire. It fueled his passion for missions. For he says, I am willing to endure, I am willing to sacrifice, I'm willing to suffer whatever need, me, need be in order to get the gospel to the elect that they might be saved. And Paul wants the doctrine of election to do, to do the same for Timothy and brothers, it should do the same for us. Let me just encourage you. You know, when we... One of, the, one of the things I have found through the years, and it's been almost 25 years ago since I came to the doctrines of grace, and I can remember that experience as almost like being born again all over. But I have found through the years that when I have had an opportunity to revisit some of those doctrines, I have found my heart get on fire in a fresh way. Because it motivates you. you it doesn't make you want to sit on your hands. It makes you want to get out there and go. Why? Because God's sovereign purpose to save the elect means that the mission will be a complete success. When Paul says, I suffer all things for the sake of the chosen so that they may obtain the salvation that's in Christ Jesus, he's not suggesting that there's a possibility that maybe one might slip through the cracks, so he better get out there and help God. No, rather, he viewed all of his sufferings as being woven into God's plan to save the elect. No matter what a minister of the gospel must endure, no matter what he must suffer, no matter what he must sacrifice for the gospel, listen, guys, it's never in vain. It's never in vain. Christ will build his church, saving all the elect. Personally, Maybe you'll agree with this, maybe you won't. I believe what Paul is saying there is that somehow, in some way, maybe not even not completely known to him, that God was weaving all of his suffering into his great design to save all the elect. Is Paul saying that he was suffering so that all that through his ministry, every single elect sinner on the earth would be saved? No, but... He was saying that God was using, I believe he was he's saying that God was using his suffering, weaving it together, maybe even in ways he didn't understand, in order to bring his great plan of salvation to pass. Don't we, don't we see him talking like that in the book of Philippians? What did he tell them? I would have you know that the things which have, which have happened to me have happened to the furtherance of the gospel. It gave him a chance to witness to the guards. It emboldened, it emboldened others to preach the gospel. Here he is again. God using his suffering to encourage a young man in the ministry. Now, when I say we, I, I don't know all of you personally, but I, I think we can, I can say this in a generic sense. It's at least I think it can be true of me at least. We can be so easily disheartened by the slightest disappointments in the ministry. Would you agree with that? So easily down and defeated when there are just small things we have to endure. What a revolution in our ministries would there be if every time there's a setback, an obstacle, we're maligned, we're misunderstood, our good, good is evil spoken of, we're mistreated in some way, or like Paul there in prison, in some way we're being confined and hindered by some limitation. What revolution would there be if in those times we would just stop, take hold of ourselves, and look up to the risen and reigning Christ and say, Lord, you're on the throne. And your word is spreading regardless of my limitations. And I know that in some way, somehow, you are working what I'm going through right now. You are working it to the salvation of your people. It's not being wasted. And when you understand that your suffering is never wasted, that it's going into the great tapestry of God's eternal plan, that gives you the nerves to lay your life out for the gospel. And furthermore, 
God's sovereign purpose to save the elect means that we should be motivated to a sacrificial ministry because he has ordained the means as well as the end. He's ordained the means as well as the end. He's not only chosen the elect. Listen, God's choice of the elect didn't save the elect. Jesus still had to come. Jesus had to die. He had to rise from the dead, go to the right hand of God, send the Holy Spirit. And guess what else has to happen? The gospel has to get to them. And God has arranged it to where the preaching of the gospel is necessary. It's not absolutely necessary. God could have chosen a different way. But Paul, in the longest section in the New Testament on election and God's sovereignty and the salvation of sinners, says, How shall they hear without a preacher? They've got to hear. Why? Because the God who chose them has chosen all of the means. And I'm going to tell you, one of the means that God has chosen to get the gospel to the elect, one of the means is that man who's willing to sacrifice everything to get it to them. In some sense, men, we should be a puzzle to people. You, you, you say, talking to myself, maybe someone's saying to me, you say, J.J., that God saves sinners from beginning to end, that none of the elect will perish. That's right. But you know, it's funny. What I don't understand when I observe your ministry is you work and labor as if it's all up to you. We should be an enigma in that way. Why? Because God's elective purposes, they do not cancel out our responsibility to be faithful. To be faithful. So if someone asked this question, well, what if, what if there are no faithful preachers willing to sacrifice all to get the gospel to the world? Wrong question. God makes sure that there will be such men. You know what the real question is, don't you? Will I be among them? There will be such men. God's purposes. His purpose guarantees it. I just need to make sure that I'm among such men. Willing to endure hardness to get the gospel to the elect. And let me tell y'all this. When the doctrine of election supposedly demotivates a man. It gives him some sense that he can sit back and take it easy with no burden. The problem at that point isn't the doctrine. It's his cold, calloused heart. Why do I say that? Because Paul says that he was doing this, notice, he was doing this for the elect's sake. He was doing this for the sake of those who needed Christ. To him, the elect was not just some theological category. The elect represented real souls under the wrath of God who needed to be washed in the blood of the Son of God. And he loved them. Remember, he says, the love of Christ constrains me. For I judge that if one died for all, then all died. So that, they, so that the ones for whom he died would no longer live for themselves but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. They were real people that he cared about. He, he didn't know who they all were. But he knew they were out there. And he had a general love for all sinners. And so he would suffer and sacrifice to spread that seed promiscuously among men knowing that they would be saved. And listen, even when someone has a wrong view of election that is in error, still then that's not the real problem. Underneath it, is a cold and calloused heart. Because let me, let me put it to you this way. What if God gave us special glasses where we could walk around and as we preached and as we go through the city where we live, we could tell who the elect were and who they are, who they're not. Should that decrease a burden in our hearts for all men in general? Jesus, you remember, 
speaking about and to people that he knew were going to be condemned, wept over them, pleaded, I would have gathered you, but you would not. You see, brethren, even if we put the doctrine of election aside, if we have hearts that love God and that love our fellow man, we will be driven to sacrificial ministry out of a real burden for their souls. We should live in light of the fact that every sinner is a breath and heartbeat from hell. And is it worth it? Let me ask you. Is it worth it giving our very lives if God would use it instrumentally in keeping one soul from the flames? So Paul motivates Timothy to be a faithful minister of the gospel no matter the personal cost. By the power of the gospel. But he also does the same by the promises of the gospel. The promises of the gospel. In verses 11 to 13, those verses contain one of those faithful sayings of the early church that we find throughout the pastoral epistles. Little creedal statements of sorts that were formulated to evidently express maybe key doctrines of the Christian faith. That type of thing. And the first part of this faithful saying conveys two gospel promises. In verse 11, we have the promise concerning our resurrection. He says there in verse 11, It is a trustworthy statement, for if we died with him, we will also live with him. Now, that's, to me, the most challenging part of the whole text exegetically. At least for, for me it is. Some interpret this as Paul pointing to the, to the ultimate price that, that Timothy could potentially pay for his faithfulness to the gospel ministry, martyrdom. And he's saying, Timothy, if you were to die in the path of faithfulness to your calling, you're in union with Christ, you'll die in union with Christ, and you'll be raised again on the last day to eternal glory. Now certainly that interpretation fits the context and the rest of the New Testament. Others interpret this as Paul pointing Timothy to the believer's union with Christ that he expounds fully in Romans 6, that at conversion we died with Christ to the power of reigning sin and we've been raised with him to walk in newness of life. And, and in favor of that interpretation, verse 11 is almost identical with Romans 6, 8, which Romans 6, 8, which reads, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. So maybe Paul is instructing Timothy to find encouragement to be faithful from his union with Christ. It's because it's out of his union with Christ that he'll have the power and the strength or, uh, to, to suffer for Christ. Or he's reminding him of the commitment and what he said at baptism, that he had died to Christ and to this world, etc., and to live that conviction out or something like that. Now what's the right interpretation, the correct interpretation? I don't know for sure. You can discuss it tomorrow at the lunch tables. I think it's probably union with Christ, but instead of getting bogged down by all of that, I want us to focus our attention on what's clear in the text, and that's what Paul says in verse 12 about the promise concerning our reward. The promise concerning our reward. Notice he says in the first part of verse 12, if we endure, we will also reign with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. Now I want you to think with me about something. None of us knows the future of his ministry from this night forward. Now I've told some folks lately that I'm learning, I'm learning, I don't know that I've learned it completely, to try to quit predicting the future with respect to my ministry. That's downhill business. How many of your ministries have turned out exactly as you envisioned it when you first started out? Don't be shy. I would guess that most of us had some expectations for what would come of our ministries when we first started out and those expectations have been dashed and long since buried. 
Maybe some of us even started out thinking secretly, hoping that you'd be the next Whitfield or Spurgeon. How'd that work out for you? Whether we're missionaries or local pastors here in the States, many of us, I think we could say this, many of us labor in relatively small works. We're not harvesting field after field after field after field of luscious gospel fruit. I'm not saying we know, we know nothing of gospel success, but it's probably not coming like you thought maybe it would when you started that church. Maybe you thought people would just sort of flood in once they found out about me. Once they could get past the way the building looked. How much gospel fruit each of us will have in our ministries is ultimately up to God. And the fact is, even though all of us are to labor sacrificially to see the elect saved, we might never reap like we expect or desire. Now, my gift is not encouragement. I understand that. But I'm just, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just telling you the facts. You would agree with that, though, right? I mean, God can do what he wants. But that might happen. You're working to see them saved, but you might get to the end of your ministry and say, wow, there's still a lot of empty seats. There's, I wanted to see more. I think all of us will feel that way to some degree. What gospel minister doesn't want to see as many as possible? The reason I say that is because it's actually one of the biggest sources of discouragement for the gospel minister. We labor so hard, wearing ourselves out for the work to go forward, and the fruit is nowhere near the effort. It's often been true. I mean, sometimes it can reverse and we get a little lazy and it kind of goes the opposite direction. It's nowhere near the sacrifices we made. It's nowhere near that, that the sacrifice you made to get that church off the ground and, and you took a salary that was just barely able to keep your head above water for years. And over time, that has a way of producing deep-seated discouragement, doesn't it? And what can happen, and this can be so subtle, the man who started off with so much zeal and commitment to lay down his life for the sake of the elect, because of what I'm talking about, he can lose that zeal. And he can sort of settle in to what we might call a survival mode. He's now in a state where he's content just to get by. Not, not because he's lazy so much, but he's just tired of the disappointments. I mean, the best way not to dis be disappointed is to keep your expectations low. He finds himself with little to no motivation to put himself out there. He's not quite as radical as he once was to see the gospel advance. And I'm not here to condemn. I'm here to sympathize with that. And then you come to a conference like this and you happen to talk to the wrong brother. You know what I'm about to say. And you're trying to hold down the envy. You're trying to say, praise the Lord, Bert. <laughs> right? And this is why, my dear brothers, you have to keep your focus on the end. On the end. To keep your focus ultimately on that day when you'll stand before the risen and reigning Christ and give an account for your ministry. Paul motivates Timothy to faithfulness as a gospel ministry no matter the cost by pointing him forward and saying if we endure we will also reign with him. That's a succinct statement of the doctrine of perseverance. The truth that all those who remain faithful to Christ in this life, no matter the hardship endured, they will reign with him in glory. They don't earn glory by persevering. 
God keeps them and preserves them unto his heavenly kingdom by his power. But they manifest that reality by continuing on in spite of all difficulties to cling to Christ and to stay in the way of holiness to the end. It's the doctrine of perseverance. If we endure, there's a conditional element to this. And all of God's true people will need it. But here we learn something about the doctrine of perseverance that's very important. And that is the perseverance of the gospel minister is bound up with his calling. Every Christian perseveres within the sphere of his God-given calling. So Paul's not writing this to Timothy merely as a Christian, though it certainly applies to all believers. He's writing this to Timothy as a gospel minister, and he's telling Timothy that his perseverance to the end, to reign with Christ, includes faithfulness to his calling no matter what he must endure. He tells him back in the, the uh, first letter, chapter 4, by giving himself to his duties as a minister, he will save himself. That his final salvation, his path to final salvation is faithfulness as a minister. So this is a gospel promise to the gospel minister who is faithful no matter what he must endure. He will reign with Christ. Time would not permit me. But to just scratch the surface of what it would mean, what it means to reign with Christ. And I don't even know what all it means. I know this, it's going to be good. And I wouldn't want to miss it for the world. It's going to be good. What do you think? I believe that's why you're here. So let me ask you this. Project yourself forward to that day. You've been faithful as a gospel minister to lay yourself out for sinners in the gospel ministry your whole life. Worn out, placed in the grave, raised from the dead, and now you're standing in glory with Christ, and you're reigning with him, and all that that means. As you look back on your ministry, do you think that you will have one regret for a sacrifice made, for something lost? Do you, do you think you'll ever have thoughts like this? Man, I shouldn't have worked so hard. I, hadn't, I shouldn't have spent so much time at it. I don't think so. I don't think so. Let me just ask you this, hypothetically. Let's say you were to labor the rest of your years. No more gospel fruit. Other than the people of God you already have that you're ministering to are growing in grace. But there are no more sinners being saved. But you're faithful to the end, and you're reigning with Christ. Will you say it was worth it? You will say it was worth it. In other words, guys, what's going to make it worth it is to hear those simple words, well done. And that will make it worth it all. It, it goes back to verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ. We're ultimately wanting his smile, and we want to desperately avoid his frown at the judgment. And Paul strikes that note as just briefly, and we're going to be done in just a moment, as he reminds Timothy of the pressure of the gospel. The pressure of the gospel. Notice in verse, the beginning, the end of verse 13, 12, rather, that we have the pressure of Christ's frown. If we deny him, he will also deny us. There's no doubt that that's the same truth that Jesus speaks of in Matthew 10 when he says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who's in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father who is in heaven. What he's telling Timothy, what he's telling Timothy is, Timothy, if you quit as a coward before the end, if you pull back in fear and you run away from this responsibility, you've denied the faith. And Christ will deny you. And you will prove you were never in him to begin with. So much for cross-centered sanctification. The Bible does not teach that just the cross and what Jesus did is the only motivation we need. If that's true, you've got a lot of explaining to do when it comes to some, some passages in the New Testament. He's warning Timothy. 
with the pressure of Christ's frown and with the pressure of Christ's faithfulness. He says in verse 13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. That's not talking about he's going to be faithless to the believer who is faithless or faithful to the believer who's faithless. It's joined with that statement at the end of verse 12. What that means, that he is faithless is, or faithful, Jesus Christ is as faithful to his warnings as he is to his promises. And that that person who pulls back before the last day and abandons him in fear because the price was too high he's going to be faithful to his promise to deny him and brethren that's what we want to desperately avoid you say this is a fear based motive absolutely but it's the fear that delivers from all other fear it's the fear and it tells us that what we're ultimately after is to please Jesus Christ there are different versions of this fictitious story this is the one I tell. I think it captures the point so well. The story is told of a, of a violinist that was an excellent top-of-the-line violinist and would put on this great recital. And he had played, I mean, he had just tore the house down. When he was done, it was a standing ovation. People just kept standing and clapping and clapping and wanted an encore. But he had run off the stage and was sort of hiding behind one of the curtains. And a man found him and he said, What's wrong with you? He says, I have failed. I have failed. He says, what are you talking about you failed? He says, they loved you. He says, look out there. They're, they're clapping. They want more. He said, but I failed. He says, what do you mean you failed? He says, well, you see, back about five rows back, you see that guy, one guy sitting there. He's not clapping. So well, who's he? Looks like he just came in off the street, horn rim, glasses, clothes all tore up like a bum just came off the street. He says, why do you care about what he thinks? He says, you don't understand. He's my teacher. He's my teacher. But it doesn't matter if the world claps. If we hear him say, well done, that's all that's going to matter. And that will make a sacrificial ministry worth it all. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness to us and your grace and your mercy. We thank you for the promises of Scripture and the warnings of Scripture. And we thank you that even the warnings, like the end of this text, they're, they're gracious, that you give us full disclosure, that you know best how to motivate us with a right mixture between promise and warning. And we have to confess, Lord, sometimes the promises don't grab us as much as the warnings and times where the warnings they don't melt our hearts but it's the promises and Lord we I pray especially for all of us that you would give us great courage and zeal to press on in faithfulness to the ministry to get the gospel to sinners no matter the cost it's in Jesus name we pray